All right, it's always good when we start the webinar and I actually see the number going up. Everybody's kind of rolling in. Hi, everybody, welcome. Uh, I'm gonna repeat this multiple times as you roll in, but in case this is anybody's first hosted at home happy hour, if you don't have your wines open, go ahead and open them. If you have them open and you haven't poured them, go ahead and pour them. If you've done both of those already, we highly encourage you to go ahead and start drinking them. Why not? This happy hour. But um, please get your wines open, get them poured while you have a couple seconds if you can. That way we can just really enjoy this process together. We'll normally give everybody about one more minute to start getting rolling in and then we will make things happen. Um, for those of you that are in, welcome to your April hosted at home happy hour. We are super psyched to have you. So. Uh, yeah, we'll give everybody like another 30, 45 seconds, and then we will get rocking and rolling. All right, and I will say for those of you, we did have some people that um, opted for the optional third wine today. Everybody will be doing the 2021 En Route Brew Mer Chardonnay and the 2020 Farniente Napa Valley Cabernet. For those of you that did opt to add on the 2019 Farniente Cave Collection Chardonnay, we will be discussing that as well. I would highly suggest maybe having the two Chardonnays side by side so that you can compare and contrast. It's the best way to find out which you like better and why. So um, I think it's been two minutes. Those that are later than two minutes don't get to hear my stellar intro. So let's go ahead and get this started. Hello, everybody. Welcome to your April hosted at home happy hour, where you're going to be joined by Farniente head winemaker Nicole Marchese. Um, I'm Todd Elliott. I am your host. Um, a couple of the usual ground rules before we get rolling. Um, you have two options for speaking to us down at the bottom. There is going to be a place for chat. We want you all to chat. We want you to come up with questions. We want you to talk to each other. Chat is basically where you're going to like share where you're from. What are you eating? What are you doing tonight, right? You're also going to see that tab that says Q&A. If you have specific questions that you would like answered during the webinar, please drop them into the Q&A, and I will do my absolute best to get them answered. That being said, what we encourage for the next 45 minutes or so is for you to just enjoy the wine, enjoy the presentation. If you have questions, we would love for you to save them till the end. With about 10 minutes left, we're going to promote everybody to panelists. And you'll be able to ask the questions yourself live. So we're going to encourage everybody to turn on your camera, ask the questions yourself. That is the most interactive part of this process. So getting to know each other in chat, questions in Q&A. If you can, hold your questions, write them down, and we will answer them at the end. So um, everybody, hopefully you've got your glass of wine, well, your three glasses of wine in front of you. And let's get started. We are going to invite in Nicole Marquette, our head winemaker for Farniente. So um, I'll wait. There she is. Hi. How's it going? Um, first off, thank you for taking the time to do this. Like I was on property today and it is definitely a time of year where things are happening. So I know you got enough going on. I appreciate you taking an hour out today to kind of hang out with us. But um, we're excited because when we see you making wine, that means we have wine to offer to people. So <laughs> um, how's it been going so far? Like how has this year been going? I know we're kind of getting rolling. So how's it going? Think, things are great. Like like okay. you noticed, it's very busy on property right now. Um, we've got a lot going on in the cellar, getting ready to bottle our 21 um, Napa and Oakville Cabernets starting next week, as well as our 2019 Dolce. Um, so Greg gets to go first with his on Monday, and then I'll follow right behind. Greg gets um, to go first so on something. I'm sure he's he gets so excited. to go first. Yeah, he's the... Um, <laughs> So we're really gearing up for bottling as well as in the vineyard. Um, we've got a lot of activity just starting. You know, we've had bud break in Chardonnay. We've got some bud swelling and um, getting close to bud break in Cabernet and Oakville as well. So just starting to um, get pretty active in the vineyard as well. I was going to ask about the vineyard because on LinkedIn, all of a sudden, like half of my feed is just pictures of bud break in the uh, valley. Is there generally like a specific pattern for like bud break happens here first, then here, then here, or is it occasionally random throughout uh, the No, it's, it, it's pretty consistent. You know, one of our earliest vineyards is always a vineyard in Coombsville called Berlinbach. It's on the hillside and it's always our first place where you see the buds start pushing and okay. the shoots and the shoots growing. And then it kind of, 
it kind of goes into Coombsville a little bit and up Valley and Chardonnay and then down, it, it kind of goes around. It really depends. But what's cool is that when you, we track all those dates, when there's bud break, when we have um, the clusters or the little clusters turning to flowers, turning into, um, turning into the small grapes, all those times we track and then they kind of line up with how they come in at harvest. So where we have bud break first is usually where we're harvesting first. So it's, you're sort of getting prepared for harvest all year long. For sure. Like I know you've told me that like a lot of your job is logistics and trying to set up like, okay, if this is happening now, we're going to be doing this here. We have to plan for it. So yeah. And that kind of leads to my next question. Okay. Bud break, right? So like things are happening. Are you excited? Do you have a sense of impending doom? Are you like already <laughs> stressed? Like what goes through your head when you realize it's this time of year when like things are going to happen? Uh, it's it's the range of emotions, I think. You know, there's always excitement when you see a new, a, the new with the new growing season. I mean, whether it's flowers or vineyards or trees, new growth is really exciting. Like to see those little buds push, like it's the start of something new. Um, and that just feels really good and sun's out. We know it's, uh, there's this sense of new beginnings, which is, which is really great. It's also like, oh my gosh, we're going to do this again. Like, oh my gosh, like here it comes again. And that sense of like, like thinking the planning ahead. Is, that um, emoji that's sorry. just the wide eyes, like, like yeah. you, you have that sense too. Yeah. But it's, but it's, I don't know. I think most winemakers, like as much as harvest is challenging in terms of hours, we all really thrive on it. Like that's why we're here. For sure. Um, so this is going to be fun because we're going to transition to talking about like one of the things that I know you love talking about, which is okay. you. Okay. Um, because I, some people might have heard some of this, but we really want to get to know, you know, like I think having that human connection helps. So like everybody knows Nicole, head winemaker at Farniente, but like where are you from? Like, tell us a little bit about you, like your journey from like little tiny Nicole to like head <laughs> winemaker Nicole, you know? Sure. So I'm, I'm from a town called Vacaville, which is about 45 minutes from Napa. Well, in that between... depends on the traffic. <laughs> Depending <laughs> on the traffic. Yeah. Depending on what's going on in Fairfield. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so Vacaville is in between Napa and Davis. And so I went to school at UC Davis um, and studied winemaking there. It's not, I don't have a winemaking back family. It's not what I went there for. I was definitely science focused. And okay. I found, I found viticulture and analogy when I was at Davis. Okay. Now, was it anybody in particular, like somebody that turned you on to it? Or did you take a random like enology class and the switch flip? Like, so I, um, I was actually working for the school newspaper, which is called the Aggie. And I was a features writer and was tasked with writing an article about the viticulture and enology department. And so I interviewed several of the professors and thought, oh my gosh, this is cool science. <laughs> this is science that you get to be inside, outside, you're making something. And at that point, I was really struggling with what I wanted to do and where I fit in and trying lots of things. So I took the introduction class and um, decided it just felt right. And I switched majors and never looked back. I mean, we're happy you did. Like personally, yeah. super pumped about your decision-making process, but. Um, not, not a great reporter, but I'm like, I feel like well, I, I can write some, my writing skills are okay. I can write some good emails and lab reports. So. <laughs> well, then I guess maybe it's good that the newspaper was not your only extracurricular activity right. in <laughs> college. Um, what sport might some people on this call be shocked to hear that you might've played at Davis too? Yes. Yeah, so random. Uh, random sport. I played rugby for two years at UC Davis. And this is why nobody team. crosses Nicole. <laughs> yeah. Um, I played growing up, I played lots of soccer and softball. And uh, when I got to um, university, I didn't play anything my first year, but was really missing, you know, being on a team and sports have been a really big part of my life. And, and you know, collaborating in that team environment, which I definitely find in winemaking as well. Um, and I had a, a friend a, who was a year older than me, who was like, you should come out and try rugby. Like it's a club sport. Um, it's a lot of soccer players. And, um, so I came out and I found like, there's really amazing people. It's really a tight knit group. Um, 
I played winger and fullback. So in the backs, a lot of kicking and running on long sides. Um, my mom came to watch me one time and said, mm, I don't know if I ever need to see this again. Like, and I was, um, but I said, mom, I just, I, I run away from the big girls and kick it and run away. Uh, but it was, it was a really great, it was a, just a really great community of, of women playing rugby. So when like there starts the, the all Napa Valley rugby league starts, <laughs> you will captain the party anti team. I can I can join in. I can definitely okay. join. Like in. whoever really the guy funny. is that just stands in the middle for everybody to huddle around, I can be that guy. I'm I got a low center of gravity and I'm not very mobile, so it's <laughs> gonna work out really well. Awesome. Okay. And you know what's so funny is uh, my hometown. They actually have like a very highly rated like national high school rugby program, and the whole base of it was ex soccer players. So when you said that, I was like, that makes such complete sense. Yeah. It's really awesome. Nice. So um, your winemaking journey, you're at Davis and in between like, you know, your hard hitting journalism and your rugby life, you are now <laughs> learning how to make wine. Once you graduated, tell us about like your kind of winemaking journey because you've done a bit of everything. Like it's super cool. Some of the places you've been to make wine. Like Yeah. So I, my first job after school was at Iron Horse Vineyards out in Sebastopol. And what was, it was a really great experience in that I was the only intern. I got to live on property. It was pretty small production a lot and a lot of sparkling wine. Um, and a lot of what I did at the beginning was like working on the bottling line. And I was like the capsule girl. I'd sit there and put capsules on as the bottles went by and then scrub off bad labels. So it was very, it was a great first experience in that like not all of winemaking is glamorous. And sometimes you gotta, there's a lot of monotony and there's just things that have to be done, but it gave me an appreciation for like all different aspects of it. Sure. Um, and, and I really appreciated getting um, great training from the winemaker there at, at Iron Horse. Um, after Iron Horse, I went to New Zealand and I worked in um, Hawke's Bay at a winery called Sacred Hill. And that gave me a great perspective on really large winemaking production because it was a facility that was running 24 hours during harvest. So you did your 12 hour shift and then another shift came on for 12 hours. So it was great to go from really small to really big and, and see both, you know, see the scale. Both parts of the spectrum. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, Came, came back to California and got a job at Gunlock Bunchu in Sonoma and worked harvest there. I was the princess of pump overs. That was my time. Um, <laughs> I'm getting you a crown now. I'm sorry. I, there's no way I'm not. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, I could man it. Okay, we're going to do this tank, then this tank, then this tank. It was it was really great. Don't and you I, deny and, royalty, you know? Yeah. <laughs> princess of pump overs. Um, and then I ended up... Uh, meeting uh the man who became my husband in Sonoma and just and so I was like I'm gonna try to look for something full-time and started at Farniente in 2005 as the enologist and have just held on for 18 years not yes. letting <laughs> and you became head winemaker for what what was your first vintage 2009 that's what okay awesome yeah. awesome um so one thing I, I'm just curious because like Farniente I think like what's got to be great for you is like Farniente, obviously the name, when you say it, it carries some cachet, but we are known for making world-class Chardonnay, world-class Cabernet. Yep. If I said, hey, Nicole, next year, you're going to make the Chardonnay, you're going to make the Cabernet, but you could make one varietal just because you're feeling saucy and you want to make it for fun. I know, but like, just if, if there yeah. was one, you know what I mean? Like, if yeah, yeah, like yeah. You say Andrew called you tomorrow and he's like, you're going to make a third one or a fourth wine next year. You pick. I would probably say I'd probably want to make some sort of like aromatic white you know oh. maybe not SB but maybe maybe another aromatic white um because I think because it's so different from Chardonnay and it's like an earlier release and I think that um I think that that would be an interesting different challenge on the spectrum of winemaking and I think it'd be pretty fun to drink too oh for sure I think just and that's what I figured. I, it was going to be something like 180 degrees from what you normally make. So I'm just always yeah. curious, you know what I mean? Because like, yeah. that is the one thing, like you make phenomenal wines, but you, you know, you make the three. And so I always curious yep. if you just got the option, what would you make? I th Yeah, I think I'd start with that. And then I'd probably then, um, I don't know. I think it'd be fun to maybe try some of the other Bordeaux varietals um, on their own. It'd be kind of fun too. And just, you know, 
to see. Well, if you ever get saucy and you need somebody yeah. just to give you an objective opinion, always here to help. Yeah. Okay. So um, do you have both of the Chardonnays or do you just have the en route today? Or I do. do. Have... I have both. Woohoo! Yes. All right. Well, for those of you that have both, we are going to talk about both. But let's start off talking about the en route. Um, I know you didn't make this one, but I also know you guys kind of chat regularly and try each other's wines. And also, you're just smart, so I can trust you on this <laughs> answer. But like, talk a little bit about where these grapes are sourced from and why we grow them where we do. Great. Yeah, so this is the 21 en route Chardonnay, the Brumaire. It's from two vineyards in the Russian River Valley um, that are, it's much cooler out there. It's a little bit later ripening. Um, it's a really great place. Chardonnay likes cool and cool environments because we want to preserve aromatics. Um, we don't want them to feel so like heavy and overripe. And Russian River is really great for that. There's some really beautiful spots. Um, the acid tends to be retained a little bit better. Um, so like for a Farniente Chardonnay, we try to grow the Chardonnay in the cooler parts of Napa Valley, um, okay. if that makes sense. Um, no, for sure. Absolutely. Like much in the same way, that's why we do Rush River Valley is because you have that inherent cool weather. Is that the right. same reason that when we do Farniente Chardonnay South Park? Right. Absolutely. Um, so this, um, this is a really great expression of Russian River. There's some really like light tropical notes. I get like a lot of lemon zest, a little bit of creme brulee. Um, Michael whole cluster presses it all. So he's super delicate on its processing. So it feels really lively and lifted and very aromatic. Um, he uses less, he uses, he said he uses about like a third of this barrel program is new French oak. So you get a little bit of some great, some structure from the oak, but it's not, it's definitely not overwhelming. It's definitely like, it just seems really light and airy, like a perfect summer day sort of Chardonnay that's really beautiful and has some great oiliness and acidity on the back end. Um, so this is the 2021 in general, in that, you know, the, the big uh, winemakers of the world group text that we know you all have. Um, how was 2021? Like, just because, I mean, we've obviously had some challenging years in the past, yeah. like, five or six years. How did 2021 go? 2021 was um, was another drought year. We'd had, it like, so not very much water, pretty, especially in Napa, where we had really small vines. So what happens then is that you have less crop. If, you're, if you don't have enough, uh, enough leaves, you can't ripen very much fruit. So you really have to be careful about keeping the appropriate amount of crop on your, on your vines. So smaller vines. Um, but then what we end up having is like really intensely concentrated fruit. So small berries, really concentrated. Um, so overall it's like great. 21 is great quality, like amazing quality, just not a lot of it. Right. Does it, yes. And yeah. I found, you know, winemakers, as I've interviewed you, nobody ever had a bad harvest. Either you got a lot of grapes or you got really good grapes. Yeah. This was a really good grape season. This is a really good grape season. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Which, Chal challenging to grow them and get them to the finish line because of like water issues, but also like, you know, staying the course and knowing that what the end result was going to be really great. Worth the effort. For, the juice yeah. was literally worth the squeeze. Worth the squeeze. Uh, see, <laughs> there we go. Topical analogies being made over here. Um, so I'll tell you what, like, one thing's let's do like the kind of tasting notes on this wine. I know there are differences in production between how Michael makes the en route and how you do the Farniente Chardonnay, but let's do kind of just your tasting notes on this one first, and then we'll talk about production differences. So yeah. tell me what you're so, getting on this one. For me, I'm getting, I get like a little bit of white floral. And I, like I said, it's very lemony and lemon zest and like really like very subtle hints of tropical. Like it's not over the top, like super super fruity. It's like really lightly layered and white floral is what really is coming up for me right now. Um, now, is that something that is indicative of Russian River Valley Chardonnays or is Michael just super good? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I guess maybe, yes. but like, I'm just yes curious, yes. you know, like, are there inherent characteristics you expect from a Russian River Valley Chardonnay? Or is this just like, I mean, like you said, he's very delicate and he comes up with kind of these ethereal notes that maybe not everybody would get from a Russian River Valley Chardonnay. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, some of those like like very faint tropical for me when I have Russian River Chardonnays, like the delicate um, delicate notes are definitely indicative. Um, Chardonnay is a really malleable grape and you can have a lot of influence on it. Um, 
not just like, not just your site, but like when you pick it and how you process it. And so I think the way that Michael has chosen to make this Chardonnay is he's really taking what the grapes have to offer with the, and, um, and capturing those floral notes and cap capturing that by being, by his gentle processing, by not overwhelming it with oak, um, by really letting the, the sites shine. It's really, it's really pretty. It really is. I mean, I, I definitely, I, the second time I got to try it was yesterday and I was like, oh yeah, like we, we make some good Chardonnay. Like I always, you know, run straight to the Cabernet and I'm just selling myself short. Um, so just real quickly, winemaker knowledge. This is the one Chardonnay that our company produces that does any malolactic fermentation, correct? No, you know what? I think in past years, there's been a few vineyards that they've sourced from that they've tried a little bit, but in these one, in this wine, he said no mallow. I think okay. the acidity no, I was in a great place. And um, so it's super, it's still super fresh and he, and he didn't need anything to go through. Well, that. then let me ask you this. If a winemaker ever chooses to, what is in it? Cause like we don't do it, but I'm not one to like bag on a different production style why would somebody do malolactic fermentation? Like, what is the point? Like, if he's done that in a couple of other vintages, what do winemakers look to get out of that process? So, uh, um, malolactic is a great tool. Um, you know, if the number one, if you want to have the butter flavor, if that's your style choice, sure, sure, sure. then that's great. You can get that. But there are also there are also ways to do malolactic fermentation without enhancing butter in it, the, that buttery flavor. But you would do it to change to um, you would do it for mouthfeel okay, and for, the, and for acidity. So there's, there are spots along the Sonoma coast where the acid in the grapes is so high because it's so cool and that's great, but you would maybe go through some mallow to soften that acid out so that it's still, it's, you get the freshness and the great acidity, but it's not like ripping the enamel off your teeth. Gotcha. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, speaking of um, not needing to do any because the grapes are gorgeous, let's talk a little bit about like the 2019 Farniente Chardonnay, because I know you said you had a little bit of this with like lunch today and it's showing out pretty nice. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's really fun to taste them side by side. I haven't done that in a long time. I know they're different vintages, but um, yeah, far, so this is our 2019 cave collection for an Ante Chardonnay. I, I personally love our wines with a few years of age on them. I think that some of that overtly fruitiness that can come, sometimes be apparent when they're really young, like tones down a little bit, you get a little bit, there's more nuance on the nose. Some, um, I get like toasted hazelnuts coming through and I get a little bit more dried floral and like dried fruit rather than like overtly, like overtly fruity wine. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so like, so as I mentioned before, so our, our grapes are grown in the cooler parts of, um, of Napa. So in Coombsville and in our new Carneros vineyard as well, where it's just, it's a lot cooler. It's greater for Chardonnay. Um, and we don't, we've never gone through Mallow at Farniente. It's been a style choice for us since day one, but also I think that Napa, you know, our acids in the grapes are where they should be. And we certainly don't want to soften them out anymore. Otherwise I feel like it could, the wine could come across as fatiguing if we did that, where we want to have richness and, and, and mouth filling flavor up front, but we still want acid on the back end to make your mouth like salivate and want to have another sip. More? Yeah, absolutely. Thousand percent. Um, so Farniente Chardonnay, like if people come into Farniente, like, and I ask, have you had any of our products before? If they say, yes, I've only had one, I would say 90% of the time, it's Farniente Chardonnay. I mean, it is the one wine that we make that I would literally consider iconic. Um, do you find that gives you more or less pressure? Like, do you feel more pressure every year because you've set this bar so high for yourself you have to meet every year? Or is there a little pressure taken off knowing that like, yeah, but people love this wine. So as long as I don't screw up, it's gonna, it's yeah. gonna be gangbusters, you know? Like, that's, I'm curious. That's a good, that's a good question. Um, I... There's a little bit of both. Honestly, there's a little bit of both. There's, oh. there's that like, okay, I, I know when we're, when we're making, we're blending, we're like, we have a North star and to have a North star, um, is really, is really important. Like we all know the, what the goal is. We're like, does this taste like Farniente? Does it not taste like Farniente? Oh. And that is like, that's really helpful. Cause it's when you're like, we're just like, I'm sure making something the first time is super exciting, but like figuring out what do you like? What is, what does it want to be? Like that's, that can be stressful. So having that North Star Farniente style relieves some pressure, definitely. Um, 
but I think also there's, there's, there's that pressure of like, well, we, we need to, we need to produce this every year and we're going to have, you know, there's vintage variations. Absolutely. But, but being consistent is really important because we want to give people what they love to drink, what we love to drink. And when harvest throws you curveballs, you, you have to figure out how do you adapt so I can still make Farniente. Right. right. Like, like, yeah, there's, like having that North star helps, but it also gives you that bar that like you have no choice, but to hit. Right. Which I can see sometimes in challenging years being a little like, yeah. yeah. So, you. but it, but it's also, uh, I will say that I think having those challenges make the job fun and exciting and, and gratifying when we, when, when we're successful, like it feels really good to have challenges thrown away, like overcome them as a team and then make something that then you go and you, where I was just in, I was just in Dallas at a wine club event and have people be like, I love this wine. And like, that feels so good. Like, oh, I <laughs> it totally does. Imagine. Well, I mean, like, it feels good to me when people tell me they love it and all I do is pour it. So I can only imagine <laughs> for you, like, that's going to feel amazing. So, so before we switch over to the Cabernet uh, question, because you talked about like, you know, 2021 was a drought year. So you had these like small berries, right? Um, having been out here for the first part of 2023, uh, we're kind of seeing the flip side of the coin. We have had what we will call a significant amount of rain in the first couple of months. We have, we have, Is that and actually, good, um, bad? it's, it's good. It's good. It's actually, um, you know, we had a lot of rain in 2019, not quite this much, I don't think, but we definitely started out the year with a, a lot of water. Um, so it's actually, it's actually great to be tasting the 2019 right now, because that was the year where I think we were starting out similarly to, so see what we did in 19. I feel like we're, we have those same chances in 2023. What's great about having a lot of water now is that we're setting ourselves up for the, for the rest of the growing season. So our reservoirs are full, you know, the, the ground has great, has a lot of water. Um, and so we can, um, we can get through the growing season without having to irrigate too much. I think it's when you, when you start the year without a lot of water that you're like, Oh my God, I hope we make it to the end. Right. Like, right. It, so, having too much water can be mitigated. Having not enough water is a problem. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, yeah. Now you said 2019 was a pretty decent year. Um, I know the Chardonnay is tasting pretty good. Uh, the Cabernet gotten any recent uh, accolades that, yeah, we've to... we've had some we've had a we've had a lot of love from the wine enthusiasts actually, and have had some really great scores for our 2019 Oakville. Um, oh, the 19 got what 98 points from enthusiasts. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Props, yeah. well played. So for those yep. of you on the call, 2019 <laughs> Oakville Cabernet showing pretty nice. The proverbial day are a fan. So just so you know. Thank you. All right. So let's talk about another awesome wine you made. Let's switch over to the 2020 Farniente Napa Valley Cabernet. Um, since I have to drive all the way back home after this, I'm only doing this one with you. So I'm going to say cheers. Let's get in on this one. So 2020, for better or for worse, a year for the books, right? Like it is not one that is going to be soon replicated, probably for good reason. Tell us a little bit about the process of like, oh God, this is happening in 2020. Are we going to make cab? Are we going to do Oakville? Are we gonna... How did this particular wine come together? Okay. So 2020, I think what we're all talking about is that we had a lot, we had fires in Napa. <laughs> and I don't want to say the a... bad word, but yes. yes. Yeah. We had, you know, we'd had a little bit of experience with that in 2017 as well. So um, 2020 definitely felt a lot different. Um, it was really smoky in the valley. Um, my take home from 2020 was that it was really important to have good relationships with our growers um, who were working together to decide what was the best course of action. Should we pick? Should we not pick? Like having that dialogue was really important. And luckily for us, we have really, we have really great growers and really great relationships. And there were some vineyards where we're like, let's, let's go for this. Let's try it. And other vineyards where we're like, I just don't, we're out here. I, there's nothing good is going to happen. So let's, let's, let's choose not to pick these grapes. So we definitely made some of those decisions. Um, and one, what I had learned in 2017, 
um, was that you still have to do your best to try to make the best wine you can and not just not just try to get by and make wine. It, that's not enough. You have to you have to try to make great wine. And um, so we still tried to extract, you know, as much as we could. And and, you know, maybe we used a little bit less oak, but we we still needed to make Farniente. So we couldn't cut corners on our process. And we. Um, tried to stay really optimistic. And then when it came time to actually start putting blends together, um, we felt that what we had from, to make our Napa Valley blend was definitely Farniente because fire is so unpredictable. You don't really know, like some, some Appalachians, the grapes seemed fine and some of them, they didn't seem fine. So we just felt like Napa Valley, we could absolutely make a Farniente Napa Valley. And we just didn't feel confident that we can make a great Oakville tier. So we didn't make Oakville. And um, we only put in the bottle what we felt 100% was Farniente. Which I think is smart. I always preach like we, we strive to have that consistent product that hits our quality level. Yeah. And so I think what we did was right. Um, two part question. For the Farniente Napa Valley blend, from year to year, from vintage to vintage, is it always going to be sourced from the same places? And second part, this 2020, was it sourced from those places or is the 2020 really a true Napa Valley blend and that, like you said, you just found some stuff that worked? Just because the Napa Valley blends a newer product. So is it yeah. always like, yeah, it's a blend, but we're getting the grapes here, here, and here? Yeah. Or we have all these quality grapes. Are you just looking for the best of what you can put together? We, so we started, we started the Napa Valley program in 2007, in 2017, actually, right. and um, it's since grown. So we've had some core vineyards that we have, um, that have been in the blend since the beginning. And then as the program has grown, we've added on new vineyards. So there, there are vineyard differences or, um, but mostly because of growth and because of new vineyards coming online. We, we try to make sure that um, my goal is to have a significant portion, you know, 40 to 50% of the blend still from Oakville um, because that's, that's our home. That's Farniente is in Oakville. That's where our expertise is. That's, we still need to be that as a core part of the blend. Like it gives their great structure. Um, like it's the backbone. Um, Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling. So yes, there are like, yeah, there are core vineyards that do make it. So the vineyards that are in the 2020 Napa Valley are some of our core vineyards for sure. So we had vineyards from um, a little bit of Oakville. We had some, we had a couple spots in Oakville that were really great for our Napa Valley blend. Oak Knoll, which is South of us had some really great stuff. Um, a little bit from Calistoga. We just sort of, it, 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 the, fi the effect of the fire was not linear. It's like it, it, it was unpredictable. So, um, yeah, if that answers the question. No, it's not. Like, it really is. Like, you're just, you're trying to make a quality product, but you're not necessarily like, okay, it has to be this grapes, this grapes, and this grapes every single No, time. I mean, we, yeah. And then as we've had more experience in these vineyards that we've brought online, like, you, you start to know, like, this is what this is bringing to the blend. Like, we, for example, we've got this great vineyard in Oak Knoll, and where it's a little bit cooler than, um, than Oakville. And those grapes tend to have a lot of color and a lot of structure and maybe not quite as layered, it's not quite as layered in their fruit flavors, right? So what it's adding to the blend is a textural component. And I know that that's what I'm going to get from there. And okay. just like with more years of experience, you start to figure out, well, this is how this one fits into our Napa Valley blend. Well, then that leads me to a question because we only started doing the Napa Valley blend in 2017. Before we get into specifically drinking this one, why? why do we even start doing a Napa Valley blend? Like the Oakville is like legacy, but like, I know we have a reasoning behind it. We weren't yeah. just throwing stuff at the wall to see what sticks. How'd this whole thing come together? So in 2017, we just, we had, we had this sort of like come together moment of like the market and like our just, and people out in the country, they want more Farniente Cabernet. And we can't, couldn't make enough and as much as I wanted to make more Oakville wine, like Oakville's a really small appellation and we can only make this amount, right? We have right. all these other people who want more for an Cabernet. And we thought, you know what, this is a really great time for us. And we had um, some vineyards coming online that we thought we have, what a great opportunity. Let's make Napa Valley Cabernet. And we'll still keep our Oakville for our wonderful club members and people who come to the winery, but 
we're experts at Cabernet, especially with how all the years, you know, making wine at nickel and nickel, the expertise of being in different appellations, like let's bring that knowledge. And, and uh, we've been making cab for a long time. So let's, let's do this. And I, I like to joke that um, I'm sure you've heard me say this before. It was so amazing for me to drive north of Oakville in Napa. There's a whole half of the valley. Like, that I wasn't getting to drive. I'm like, what? This is amazing. Because my the journey would have been new. <laughs> <laughs> like, how Stoke is amazing. Um, here. Oh, like yeah. And what's when, what is what's really great is that Farniente, the, the first few vintages of Farniente were actually in Napa Valley Cabernet. A lot of it was from Oakville, but we were in Napa Valley. And it wasn't until about 2000 that we switched to be to being Oakville. So it's really kind of kind cool of feels full circle. From our history almost. Yeah. That's yeah. really cool. Awesome. Yeah. Um, well, before we start talking about this one specifically, we're on the Farniente Cabernet kick. What can you tell us about like the future of Farniente Cabernet? Like what, what do we got coming down the pipe? Are we going to kind of focus on what we're doing? Like, oh, like I, I think people praise our consistency, but new stuff is fun. Like what, what do you see for the future of Farniente Cabernet? Well, I think for, for, the, for the Napa Valley Cabernet that you would like see in a wine shop or like see in a restaurant, um, what's exciting there is that we're we're so successful with it that we're we're growing and we're signing new vineyards and so for me personally it's really exciting to be going out into new vineyards and seeing how that they how they um are able to blend and marry with our home vineyards so that's really exciting to bring on um and then at our at the Martin Stelling vineyard what's super exciting is that we're um partway through a replanting process where the vineyard was um you know, there are some really old blocks, which are great, but we had some virus issues and um, had a good opportunity to pull some stuff out to replant. And with that replant, what we're doing is shifting row direction, which will, which um, is important since we're getting so much warmer all the time. It's better, like the better, better light exposure. Um, and so that's, that's really exciting is to see, is to see the replant coming on for sure. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so let's kind of get into this one. 2020 Farniente, Napa Valley Cabernet. Uh, you kind of give us your tasting notes on this one. So I get like a lot of um, mixed berry and some like dried, dried berry, like compote. There's some, there's like subtle hints for me of like leather and tobacco, just like really, really subtle. There's a little bit of, um, anise like kind of like like little bit of black licorice is not over the top where it's like like yeah anise where it's that fennel sort of floral savory note on it along with the along with the floral all right now i gotta try and get that way all right and for me it's really classically farniente and that it's very silky there's like I was just going to ask you about the mouthfeel on it. It's right. really, it's really silky. The tannins are really fine grain where they're, they're coating the mouth, but they just, they feel really like they're melting away on the back end, which is really nice. I get some fresh acidity as well, which I think is a, as a hallmark for Farniente where it has some brightness and freshness and lively. Um, I think it's really for such a young wine, it's actually pretty open and approachable right now. Um, that was what I was yeah. going to ask, because it's kind of a baby right now. I mean, 2020. Um, so you personally, in your household, do you tend to skew a little bit towards younger cab? Do you give it a little bit of age? Do you go for those long term funky like? OK, so two part question once again about how long do you normally age your Cabernet in general? And when somebody inevitably asks you every single day, how long should they age their Farniente? Do you even have an answer you give them? Because it's it's so subjective. I'm it's curious so, what your opinion yeah. is, but I want to know the answer you give too. Yeah, we definitely skew towards older in our okay. house. Okay. Um, so we're sort of in the, what do like, 12, 13, 12, 13 right now, which isn't super old, but like skewing right. a little bit older or, um, you know, if we buy special bottles, um, we'll definitely hold on. We'll definitely, you know, be drinking some, I think we had like an 05 of something the other, like it, it's fun to taste the old ones for sure. Um, but we definitely, we want to put at least, at least five to 10 years, I would say 
for us in our house on, oh. on Cabernet and Chardonnay. We're probably in that, um, you know, one to five year is where we tend to like Chardonnay, but we definitely skew a little bit older for Cabernet. Just, um, just cause I, I, I know it's going to be a little bit softer and more approachable and, um, yeah. But, and if anybody asks when, when should I drink this? I have a couple of different answers. Um, depending right. on what the wine is, like, there's no, there's no like magical, like this is the time, right? And if it you really go past depends. this, it's no good, right? Like, <laughs> 100% depends on how you like to enjoy wine. If you like really young wine, then drink it young. And if you want really aged, if you want older wine, then drink it older. And I I personally think, I mean, this sounds kind of cheesy, but I think the right time is if you have the right people with you because wine should, is meant to be shared and enjoyed with others. So if you have an occasion to open a bottle of wine with people you really care about, you should just do it. <laughs> don't, <laughs> like, don't worry about like missing the window because you're going to have a great memory with it. Well, then last question then about aging, because I know it's kind of hard to talk about aging Farniente Napa Valley when we've only been doing it since 2017, but just based upon the vintages you've done so far, would you lay down the Napa Valley and the Oakville about the same amount of time? Do you think one is more approachable younger? Like what, what would um, your thoughts right now yeah, on we're, limited information? We're making, I mean, we're, we're making them in a similar style because they, they both need to represent Farniente's house style where we've got some structure and we've got some acid. And um, I would say in general, the Oakville could probably lay down for a little bit longer, but they're, but they're probably pretty similar. Okay. Yeah. Well, before we promote everybody to panelists, um, and I do have a good question to start off once we promote to panelists, but um, one, Farniente. Obviously, you're going to be there. You know, you, we got to at least get two more years for reasons that we've already discussed. Yes. <laughs> but you're going to be, we're saying you're going to be here at least five more years, right? Okay. Five years from now, where do you want the Farniente winemaking program to be? Uh, or are you content with being like just as awesome as it is now? Like, you know what I mean? Like, it, yeah, I think just as, just as awesome. Um, I, every, I mean, every year, I like to try to figure out how to do it a little bit better and a little bit easier. I have a team. We were so sidebar. We just had um, we just had a luncheon today for every for everybody who's been with the company for ten years or more. A lot of those people are on my team, and many of them are approaching twenty or even longer. My seller master is just in his thirtieth year with the company. So crazy. So, one of the things that we're always thinking about is like, okay, we, we, we all enjoy making this for, but how do we make it? So continue to make great wine and do it in a way that is, um, supporting people too. Right. Like, so I, I would love for Farniente's wine making program to be still in amazing vineyards. Um, like, I would love our winemaking and our wine growing to be vineyards that are lasting for a long time that are like great for the environment. Um, and I would love um, our winemaking to be thoughtful of the people who are making it so that we can all continue to make it for as long as we can. Well, then uh, second part of the question, in 10 years, when obviously you're still the head winemaker of Farniente and people are writing articles about you, like Nicole Marquez, the best winemaker in Napa, right? Like, <laughs> what do you want him to say in that first paragraph? Like, what, what do you want your legacy to be in the Napa Valley? Oh my gosh, Todd, you didn't prepare me with this question. I wanted to get your like off the cuff reaction because I mean, you're an amazing winemaker working for an iconic winery. Like I hate to tell you, you're going to be remembered. So what do you want people to remember your winemaking and your product for? Um, I think like my, my gut reaction on like the, on the, on the actual wines is I want to be rem remembered for making like but we've talked about being consistent with our winemaking, not the same every year, but consistently, consistent quality, consistently delivering. And, um, and I want to be remembered for making wines that people have an emotional attachment for, to and just really love like what, like the feedback we get with Barney and Jay Chardonnay that like, like I said, it feels really good. And I, um, I actually do really get a lot of pleasure from hearing people say, I had this at this with, at my wedding or at this, or we served Farniente for this. And like the fact that we're making something that people create memories around like that, 
like I want that legacy of oh, making okay. something that people like really cherish in their life. Um, and then purse and then in terms of not the product, but me as a winemaker at Farniente, I feel like I'm in the point in my career where I want to transition to, and it's a total work in progress, not is being remembered as a person who was a really good mentor and teacher. And um because I've I've had that and I um yeah, I want to be somebody who contributed to the success of my company and the success of people, um, not just by making, not just with the wines that I make, but by like the person I am at work. I'm not going to lie to you. I blindsided kind of- you with a question and you set me up with a perfect segue. So okay. um, we're going to start promoting everybody to panelists. And I'm going to ask this first question. And it's funny considering the last statement you just made, because this question has been asked of every winemaker. So you get it too. And by the way, you're not allowed to say Andrew, but you said you want to be remembered (laughs) as a mentor because you had that. Do you consider your, your mentor in winemaking and like, tell us a little bit about that. So I've, I've had a few. Um, I was the, the winemaker before me who hired me was Stephanie Putnam and she's the director of winemaking at Raymond. Um, she, uh, it's just so tenacious and so passionate and so organized and the dedication that, um, that she showed was like, when I first started, was like, Oh my God, this is so overwhelming, but I really appreciate her dedication and attention to detail and just like throwing her heart and soul into it. So she was a really great mentor for just work ethic. And then, um, I was fortunate that Ashley Heisey, who was, um, Farnity's winemaker in the nineties, came back in sort of a consulting mentor role as well um, when I became winemaker. And I just admire her so much. She's just a genuinely good person who wants to do the right thing, who removes ego from the equation and is so smart. Like Like, she was a person who I could be like, this is the problem. This is what I'm thinking. And we would, and we would problem solve together. And I just really, I admire that. And, um, and then personally, she has two, two boys that are young men now. Um, and I have two younger boys. And so having somebody who had sort of been through what I had was going through with kids and working and boys specifically, like that, that was invaluable to me. That's really cool. Um, well, just um, I'm going to open it up. If anybody has a question, please feel free to unmute and pop in. But meanwhile, I got a couple that have been submitted beforehand. Okay. Um, one of them, just since we're talking about the Cabernet right now, we know the answer to this. So I guess it's more getting a why. Somebody asked if you do the same blend on the Farniente Cabernet every year. Like, is it the same amount of Cabernet and do you blend it with the same stuff? Which we know, no, you don't, right? Why is it in an effort to stay consistent, like you talked about within Farniente, or are you just kind of like, well, no, I got some great Malbecs, I'm going to blend with it. Like, how do you decide your blending process? So the the way the the blending process works, to to be honest with you, is after harvest in like Jan- January, February, after the harvest, we literally take a week and we go through and taste all the wines. So we'll do like 15 in a day. So like all the different lots from one vineyard and, you know, we kind of score them and talk about which blend do we think that these might be appropriate for, and then start making, then we just start making trial blends and taste them. And that's, that's the process. And it's sort of iterative where we get to, you know, maybe 75% in that first round and then through aging, um, you know, sometimes a wine might need like a racking, like it needed some air for us to like really f- see like what it's, what it could add to the blend. We'll do blend trials throughout the year and just sort oh. of keep, keep, keep adding until we f- feel like we've got the right blend for Farniente. So you feel like you've got Farniente? Yeah. yeah. And sometimes that means have like, you know, sometimes that means having a lot of Merlot, like in 2019, there's actually quite a bit of Merlot in the blend because we had really amazing Merlot that year. Which yeah. seems to have worked out great, you know? Yeah. yeah. Then, you know, this, the 2020 Napa Cabernet is a hundred percent Cabernet. There's no, right. because it seemed like the other Bordeaux varietals were affected by the smoke more than Cabernet Sauvignon was. So we made a hundred percent Cabernet Sauvignon um, because that's what the vintage gave us. Awesome. 
Well, last one before I let people ask questions, because this one's just kind of a frivolous one, but this is a fun one because I'm pretty sure I asked Joe the same thing. Uh, tomorrow you wake up with a superpower. Which one and why? Okay, so my kids sometimes ask me that. They're like, would you rather be invisible or would you rather fly? Which is like, the two I, that most people go towards, right? but you can pick anything. Right. Well, I think I would rather, I think flying would be cool. I don't really like heights, but I think I could overcome that if I was confident in my flying ability right. and like I could visit vineyards faster than having to drive on Highway 29. So I think, I think flying would be cool. <laughs> um, just before we ask questions, I do want to let you know that the next time you see Shane Price, you should ask him what his answer to that question is. Okay. There's okay. a reason his superhero is Super Song. Okay. Okay. okay, so just ask Shane next time you see him. Yeah. All right, so anybody on the call? Does anybody have any questions for Nicole? And once again, I will drop in. God forbid you have any questions for me. I will answer them, but something has gone wrong with your life. Um, anybody? We have, All right. we have a question. Birds, I just saw you on mute. All right, yeah. come in. I oh, know yeah. you're not a Caitlin, but still, go ahead. No, Caitlin, Caitlin's over here. She's lovely. Okay. Um, oh, you, have well. act, right, you, you get to walk around the cave. And we all, well, many of us have seen the cave. It's every vintage ever. You get to pick one wine. What are you grabbing? Oh, dang. Steve, but also that's a great question to ask you because it might not necessarily be because you're picking the one you think's the best. It might be just because it's one that you didn't yeah. pick or one that maybe you haven't tried in a while. Yeah, if we let you loose in the wines in the library, what bottle are you opening? Okay, so Cabernet. Cabernet, I'm probably going for something from the early 90s. I think like the last time I had the 1994 was really amazing. So I might check in on that one because I have a memory of that being really good. And Chardonnay, if there's a Magnum in the caves, I'm going for the 2011 um, because that was a really hard year. And I love the Chardonnay that we made from it. And it was the year that I became a mom. So that's probably what I'm That's going. awesome. Okay. We need like a Nicole's library release. <laughs> We're, you're not, you're not like, going let's for find a, a 94, 94 shard. and a 2011 shard. <laughs> yeah. You know what? That's not a bad idea, though. In all honesty, like one month, we'll put together just like a package that's like Nicole's cave releases. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like, Why yeah, not? Absolutely. Get the credit cards hot. We're ready. <laughs> no, absolutely. all right. Everybody, get a hold of me. I'll put the pressure on Nicole. We will make this work from the back end. Perfect. All right. So, who else we got here? Petersons. You normally have a pretty decent question on deck. Uh, I don't know. If Gary Lawrence is on this call, but he normally comes up with something. Maybe Bill. Anybody? Mark and Pat. You guys look way too comfortable out there. You guys gotta have a question for it. Like everybody always asks me questions that are better answered by Nicole. We've got Nicole. <laughs> all right so let me see we did have a couple more that were like um do what type of oak do we use to age do we always use the exact same oak and the exact same coopers and if so why so we always use french oak um okay. that has been a style um that's just stylistically what we've done it doesn't mean that you know Hungarian or American oak is better or worse. It just means that for the, the wine that we make, French oak seems to work the best for what we're doing. Um, we change the per, we've changed the percentage a little bit over the years as we've kind of fine-tuned where we want it to be. So on our Chardonnay, we're about 50% and our Cabernet is anywhere from 65 to 75, depending on, on the year and, um, and the vineyards. And we generally use the same Coopers every year. We've had really good, um, we feel like those really match our wines well, but there are so many Coopers and it's crazy. And they all have this many different wines and this toast level and this grain tightness, and this is steam bent and this is water bent. And this is, um, uh, there's so many different choices and it can be overwhelming when I, I remember when the, the first year I was like, we're going to try all these things, all these things. And then keeping track of it all, <laughs> it's really hard. So as over the years, we've really simplified, but usually, you know, if a Cooper that I have a good relationship with, they're like, Hey, we've got this new barrel. Can you, do you want to try it? We'll do a two barrel trial and we'll keep them separate and we do tastings and try. And so sometimes Cooper's new Cooper's come on, um, 
but in an effort to stay consistent and and uh, simplified, like we try to keep it to the same coopers. We have a we use a lot, but we have a big big barrel program. Nice. Chad, dude, Chad, you unmuted and then I talked over you. Come on in, buddy. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no worries whatsoever. Um, I'm actually going to put um, uh, both of you as well as your team on the spot in the sense of um, we've been doing this for several years now and is one of the most enjoyable experiences that we have. Uh, the one problem that we have at the moment is that unlike, I believe it's Mark and Pat, we were we were set up to be on our patio underneath <laughs> some great lighting in the dark on the East Coast until some rain set in and we were forced into our dining room and we were like, oh, well, that's what it is. So we're jealous of them because we were ready to be out there. Uh, after the last session, uh, we had several individuals from the wine team follow up with us on a couple of questions, uh, both by phone and by email. And so the 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 team there is absolutely wonderful. And it's one of those things that speaks to the leadership all the way from the top, from Beth and, and the corporate folks, all the way down to all of the winemakers. Um, what an absolutely great organization. And you all should be proud. Thank, Thank you. you. I really appreciate that. So, uh, did you? I mean, that allows you to like ask whatever question you want. I mean, no, like, but that, thank you, Chad. Like, that's well, awesome. one other question uh, Pam wanted to know was uh, well, we, we have boys as well. And so, like, when you're celebrating a milestone, like, what would be the wine that you want to toast to celebrate a milestone in, in you know, motherhood? They're growing. You want to keep them little, but they can't be little all the time. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think birth years are really, obviously birth years are fun. I mean, but like you're saving, I mean, you're saving the bottle for you, right? If you're saving the wine for your kids. Um, so I think birth years are fun. Um, so for like my kids, it's 2011, 2014. So the 14 uh, Farnese Cabernet isn't like in a great spot right now. And so, um, you know, to t toast a milestone for my younger son, I would probably do that one. Um, for your older son, though, I will champion in the 11 until I'm blue in the face, because I know it was such a difficult year for yeah. you guys. And I think it's such a good wine. Like, yeah. And and I mean, it's hard to pick a vintage. I mean, I think it depends on, you know, what milestone you're celebrating and does that year have meaning for you? So I'd probably like I'd probably pick a year that has meaning for you. Um, but I would also maybe have fun with magnums because like if you're toasting a milestone, like maybe you have more people around and magnums can be really fun as well. And don't magnums as a general rule age? They age, they age like a little, they age a little bit longer. Yeah. Oh. Um, so quick question we got, like, because one thing that I think is great is that we do have like somebody overseeing the winemaking program, but each one of our wineries has its own specific winemaker, which allows you to focus on the product you're making. But how collaborative is your process? Like, are you and Joe and Michael trying each other's wines during the like blending process? Or once you get into the nitty gritty, is it like, let me make my wine and then you can try it afterwards? Like how, obviously you are the head winemaker from Farniente, but I mean, do you really get a lot of collaboration or are you also busy making your own thing that you just kind of catch up after? I, um, so we don't, we don't really collaborate like on right. blends, okay. right. but there's other ways that we collaborate. So for example, Joe, Joe at Nickel and Nickel, he and I share a few vineyards where he gets, we get different blocks, but we're in the same vineyard. So oftentimes like Stelling, we'll try to walk that together and talk. And, and that's really, um, it's great to have another perspective out there when we're getting like getting up to harvest especially or like what are you thinking about picking and this is what I'm thinking about picking so there's some collaboration there and shared like especially in shared vineyards um we collaborate um in that we get together for educational tastings and so it's really you know it's will be we just did a tasting where we did some Barolos and so we'll get together and taste as as um as a group and that's a fun way to just collaborate in like practicing winemaking like practicing tasting and talking about it and what tastes good um and then in other ways that we um we rely on each other is um you know if something happens in the cellar and we're like called like hey we're having this issue how, how did it work for you guys did you guys have this and so there's definitely um there's moments where we 
it's so great to be able to pick up a phone and call somebody and know that they've got your back to help you out with a problem because they may have seen it too and, and vice versa. That's really cool. Um, so just really quick, the 2020 that people have in front of us, I think just because it was a fire year, people are just a little bit more curious. Trying to mitigate the effect of the fires and the smoke, is that more during the winemaking process or is that a lot more important when you're testing and selecting the grapes? Like, is there anything you can do to mitigate it when you're making the wine or do you just need to make sure your grapes are good before you even start making it? Or is the answer just yes, all of the above? It's a mixed bag. Okay. Honestly. Okay. So you you can you can send out and test your grapes and have an idea if you think that you're starting with something that might have a problem. Um, with with red wines, um, what they've discovered is that a lot of the smoke issues are in the skins. So if you a lot some people try to not be on the skins for as long to try to mitigate the amount of smokiness. Um, what we found in 2017 was like if we tried to not be on if we tried to not be on the skins, then we made a really um, thin weak wine that just wasn't good anyway. Right. So we're still we're still staying on the skins to try to extract. Um, <clears throat> we used a little bit less new a little bit less new oak so that people so that you know some of the compounds that you um, smell in a smoky wine are actually the same compounds that you would get from a new oak, like a really toasty oak barrel. Um, so maybe just limiting the amount of new oak. Um, there's there are a variety of products that people say can work. There are filtrations that people say can work, but ends up what's happening is that you filter it, it goes away, and then it comes back. And um, so it's there's still tons of research being done at Davis, at Washington State University is actually doing quite a bit. Australia has done a ton of um, research, so they're a really great resource. Um, yeah, it's it's a mixed bag. Okay, I'm just curious. Like Basically, you're just doing everything you can to mitigate it on both sides of the coin so that you can make a product you're proud of. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, we've gone a couple minutes over, but if anybody else has a question, I would love to still give you the opportunity to get it answered. Bueller? Bueller? Something D-O-O -O economics? No? All right. Um, <laughs> by the way, found out for any movie bus, Ben Stein absolutely ad-libbed that whole thing. They just said, go up there and act like a boring teacher, and that was what he came up with. I Amazing. thought that was super awesome, right? All right. Well, um, I'm going to say this first off. Huge thank you to all of you for taking some time out of your evening to hang out with us and drink a little bit of wine. Massive thank you to Nicole for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and hang out with us. Um, for those of you on the call a little bit later tonight, you are going to get a copy of a recording of tonight because we gave you so much amazing information. You're going to need to watch it back. And just know when you decide that you need to restock please on the website, use the code hosted, H-O-S-T-E-D at checkout, and you will receive 20% off of all the wine so that you can get stocked back up. Um, we are looking forward to seeing you next month. You will get the information on the wines shortly, but it is going to be a get to know you with our new estate chef, State Chef Bill, who came over to us from the Thomas, Thomas Keller Wine Group. Uh, He's Thomas amazing. Restaurant group. Oh, I mean, come on. Absolutely. I'll say he's amazing now. I will not say it while he's on camera, but yes, we, we are very much looking forward to all of you joining us next month. We'll get to know Chef and we'll enjoy some really good wine again. Um, I really appreciate y'all being a part tonight. My name's Todd Elliott. I'm your host at Home Host, and I better see all of you with friends next month. Um, bye, everybody. Bye, yep. thank you. Lauren, I'll see you next month, buddy. <laughs> thank you, everyone.